WNOV 860 and W293CX 106.5, Milwaukee. Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're going to talk about compact gardening, how to get the most out of your small gardening space. As well as advice on how to plant those fruit and bush trees so they have the best success. And we're also going to talk with author and food escape expert, Bree Arthur. As well as your garden questions and our garden answers. So tell your garden friends that Garden Radio is on the air because it starts right now. You're tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee with your host, Joey Baird, who grew up in the country but now lives closer to the city, and Hallie Baird, who has always been a city girl. Combined, they have over 25 years of gardening experience who believe in simple gardening practices. A gardener for all gardeners, founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com where they created over 800 how-to garden videos to teach others how to grow more of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they discuss vegetable gardening and more. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether on those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the Radio tab on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com website, or anywhere in between, I am your host Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com is your destination for all things gardening. Eight over nine hundred videos now on the website. Short, long format for your educational and entertainment purposes, as well as on the main page, a segment, uh, a portion where you can watch segmentations of this program in studio video and podcast. This show is possible every Saturday morning for you by great sponsors you'll hear throughout the program, in addition to... Nacelle Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nacelle is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nacelle Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find more at nacelle.com. And there's a number of ways in which you can contact us through the well, through, to talk to us on the show here. There's a couple of different ways we, we can do that. You can call on the Ivy Organic hotline. Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees. Ornamental trees and shrubs. This is product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. You can go to ivyorganics.com. Call in at 414 414- 444-5250 anytime during the show with your gardening questions or comments. And you can also email us at twvgradio at gmail.com, twvgradio at gmail.com anytime, 24-7 to get a hold of us. You can also tweet us using hashtag twvg. So a number of ways in which you can get a hold of us during uh, the show as well as after. So I was in the garden yesterday, Ollie, and, and uh, to me, I think we're uh, from last year, we're two weeks behind where we were a year ago at this time, but also the weather has not been as nice. We were in the garden 30 days earlier last year than we'd ever been before. So uh, it's one of these things where June 1st, I think we're behind, which technically we kind of are, but we're really not. But I think by the end of the today, even though it's raining, uh, the rain will help a little bit and we'll be able to get caught up on uh, the gardening and be where we should have been a year ago where we are today. I think I think that'll be where we will be okay then. I think you're just spoiled from last year. Well, whether you have, you know, 18, 2,000 square feet of garden, or maybe you're, you've you already got your garden planted, uh, it's a difference of size, and, and, you know, if you only have your garden already planted, you're good for you. If you don't, uh, maybe you're in the same boat we are, and still trying to get things in the ground. Well, let's you're talk- just dramatic, oh, that's I'm, all. I'm dramatic. just dramatic, okay. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about, we've got a lot of stuff covering the show today, let's talk about uh, you planting vegetables in which you felt you couldn't plant, you couldn't grow on your property because you didn't have a big garden like you remember your parents or grandparents or neighbors have, having years ago. There's a bunch of varieties uh, that you can grow in containers, raised beds, or actually in the ground that do not take a massive amount of space. A lot of people think, and, and Holly, you're, you, you grew up in the city, a lot of people probably have the perception that I don't have a large area. So I can't grow this type of vegetable or fruit. 
Well, right. There are certain vegetables you might feel that you you can't grow because, like you said, you might not think you have a lot of space. But that's not always necessarily true. Like, for example, you can uh, a lot of people enjoy beans. So you could bo- grow pole beans in a, like a five-gallon bucket and then attach a trellis to that bucket. Or put it up against a fence or if you have, you know, we've talked about this fence, make sure you have the uh, rights on both sides or agreement. But pole beans are incredibly easy to grow. One of the easiest crops uh, to grow, I mean, you do have some issues with the potential of bean rust later on in the season. But other than that, it's like simple. Uh, plant the bean seed. You don't have to buy the starts. Uh, you don't buy the starts. You just buy the seeds. And there's still seeds available at MI Garden. I do want to point this out because I got the email last night. If you're looking for more seeds, whether you're going to plant fall crops or want some more summer crops, if you go to the MI Gardener store, migardener.com, and go to the uh, ch- at, at checkout, use June 40, J U N E 4 zero you can say 40 percent on your purchase uh very good deal that he's got running right now but bean, so, pole, yeah, beans so are, pole beans in a bucket even bush beans in a bucket as long as that container has as long as that container has drainage holes ladies and gentlemen because you got to have drainage holes in your containers and you want to make sure you're planting the right size you cannot plant something like a tomato plant in a one gallon bucket you're like ice cream bucket because that tomato plant will fail uh, it those tomato plants it, want at least probably about a five gallon bucket size to get production to get something worth your effort so and let's talk about com- uh, tomatoes there's all kinds of varieties there's, we we would recommend a compact variety tomato and then you can find these even at blue mouths there's some compact varieties or hanging basket varieties you could start your tomato seeds from seed now in the garden and holly you did this for years before you even knew such a thing as a transplant well yeah we i'm not faulting you i'm just letting you know that people are there are individuals who just plant the actual seed in the ground and don't worry about a transplant right that's what we did every memorial day weekend we put the seeds in the ground tomatoes cucumbers not you didn't go to the garden center and buy the starch you physically put the seed in the ground right yeah yeah so, um, and we still had tomatoes in August. Okay, that's fine. You, and, th- and like everything, we just put in the ground, seeds in the ground. Uh, so compact variety tomatoes, very easy. You Don't can, judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm just making it a point because a lot of people may think that you have to go and buy no, a $2 start. No, you absolutely do not have to. Right. Yeah. And then we, we talked about pole beans. Let's talk about cucumbers because a lot of people think cucumbers are this very sprawling, viney vegetable, which to a certain extent is true, but there are varieties in which are, co- are bush variety cucumbers. Right. There are bush variety cucumbers out there, and they are nice for containers, or if you have a small garden space, they're going to be a nice little compact cucumber bush. You can also grow them in a trellis. You can, same as the pole beans. Put them on a trellis, and, and they're elevated, and you can see them just fine. With that being now, uh, the next one here, a lot of people is going to go. Wait, whoa, hold on, this doesn't make sense. Pumpkin, pumpkin on if you let based on, okay, there's several different varieties of pumpkins. There's Jack B. Littles, which are the little decorative pumpkins you buy at Halloween. There's Jack O' Lanterns, which are the ones that you buy and carve out. They're not really good for eating. We've ate them, but they're they're very stringy. They're actually bred for the purpose of mass production and selling them for you to cut up for the kids or decorative purposes. Then there's the massive giant ones, you know, the size of a small, small car. Those are, the, but the, the general eating pumpkin uh, will take up most times thirty to forty, sometimes sixty square foot of area if you allow it to do that. But you can control the vines in which you can get pumpkins in a relatively small area. We had at uh, Holly Sisters, we planted some Jahardia pumpkins, which are a bluish gray pumpkin. And got 45 pounds worth of pumpkins off of them growing out of a bag of compost. They, they did sprawl very rapidly and, and wildly because they didn't control them. But you can control them. You can cut them back as they grow. That does a couple of things. That puts more energy into the fruit production of the plant. And also, it keeps the vines from going all over the place. Right. So pumpkins can be done. Pumpkins... Uh, I, I would wait until about well, next week you could plant your pumpkins and be safe because pumpkins really need a lot of warm soil to, to grow very well. So that would be something that you can do that maybe a lot of people didn't think you could grow. So you can grow pumpkins for decorative purposes. We grow it for food production because we think that's more valuable than buying a pumpkin and cutting it up. Yeah, one thing I want to mention here yes. um, is radishes. You can fit 16 radishes in one square foot. 
So that's that's when, good. That's in the spring and fall, don't plant right, radishes now right. because they will go straight to seed. But also those seed pods in a but green carrots, state. Yeah, I mean, carrots you can do uh, 16 in a square foot as well. Right. So if you're thinking about root crops, um, even beets you can do 9 in a square foot. So that's something to consider. And, and with the radishes... If you, when I say bolt or go to seed, they put a central stalk on flower and then produce seed pods. In a green state, those seed pods are edible and they taste just like the bulbs. So, if your radishes, you, you you could potentially there are you could potentially plant radishes now. Let them go to seed and eat the seed pods. There right. are some varieties in which only produce the seed pods for edible purposes. So you know that's that's a couple of a uh, couple of things there. Peppers, peppers. Yeah, you could fit. Probably about two per square foot. Yeah, might be might be pushing a little bit, but you could probably get two in a five gallon bucket. Yeah, and, and again, works very well. And you can put those seeds just right in the ground too. Well, you could, but I would recommend if you're going to go peppers, spend the couple of bucks at Blue Mills and actually buy the starts because peppers are very, very slow growing vegetable. Tomatoes are very rapidly growing. To- peppers will take a very long time. That's why we we start our peppers indoors for our particular gardens. Uh, middle of February, and we plant them out Memorial Day weekend because they take so long to grow. So invest a little bit of money on the uh, the little money you invest in a plant start at Blue Mills will in, ex- exceed it, the return on investment will be, you know, multiple compared to what uh, you buy at the store because an organic pepper, Holly, is what? A couple bucks? Right. Uh, well, not not like you mean like one pepper. Well, however you buy them in packs of three, they're very they're they're much more expensive than buying the plant and and getting the production off the plant. Right, and the thing you know, even even us, we started a lot of seeds in that one year. I think that was what two years ago. Our peppers got taken over with aphids in the greenhouse, and we had to go buy a couple pepper plants. Right, starts. and there's nothing wrong with that. We try to do, try to grow as many things from seed and not have to purchase them. But there's times where it's good to have that back up. And we had the problem with the aphids again this year, but I was able to control it with soapy water and uh, very vigilantly watching them and, and treating them like little children, basically, and making sure that they were healthy. And now they're almost all on the ground now, and they're doing fine. So we were able to save those peppers right. um, t- that way. So just because you have a little space, don't just say, okay, I'm just going to let the grass grow or the weeds grow up. Try to utilize that space. Grow something. Or if you maybe you, you don't want to turn your soil over or use your soil, you think your soil might be shady or you don't know, then you can definitely think about some containers as well. Yeah, containers, uh, grow bags, raised be- uh, grow bags, buckets, straw bales uh, works just well. Well, when we come back, have you planted your trees or shrubs or hedges yet? If you haven't, I'm glad you haven't because we've got some information that you need to know so you do not make the mistakes that common people make when they plant these type of uh, plants. When we come back right after this. Have a gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautiful. Beautifully with the Embrace. Available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. Hot Shed Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour, and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family owned company, continual standards that are non GMO, organic at the highest safety levels. Offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed, and more. Even kosher and gluten free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information, and recipes, visit HodgsonMill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. 
Visit RootMaker.com. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at GreenstockGarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. GreenstockGarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit GreenstockGarden.com. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. This is not a drill. With your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It is not a drill. This is the real deal. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your destination for all things gardening. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, 900 plus videos and a whole lot more. Well, a whole lot more of some great produce is going to be drove to our neighborhoods in a matter of a few weeks from TreeRipe.com. If you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out TreeRipe Citrus Company. You can find out where to pick up top quality produce from Tree-Ripe.com. They have beautiful, tasty peaches and juicy sweet blueberries. If you're sick of bland, mealy peaches and lackluster blueberries from your local grocer, Tree Ripe has what you need. They come right to a stop in your neighborhood, fresh off the truck, right from the source. For location and schedules, visit tree-ripe.com. They have locations all over, including Iowa, Upper and Lower Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and right here in Wisconsin. Tree-ripe.com is your go-to place for the freshest produce around. And you can go to their website and click on the tab, and it will actually specifically say what neighborhood, when, and all that that goes along with it. How many times are going to be here? Well, from peaches at, from treeripe.com to planting trees, whether you're fruit trees, nut trees, ornamental trees, shrubs, or hedges, or bushes, there's some things that you need to know to do it safely, to do it right, so you don't have problems down the road come years down, come, come years to come. Um, so whether you're going to plant a, a fruit tree, a nut tree, an ornament, whatever, there, here's some steps that you need to observe to focus on before you just shove your shovel in the ground and start digging. So the first one, I think, would be... you got to call Digger's Hotline. Dig, yeah, call Digger's Hotline. That's important. Any, anytime you're going to dig or whether it's for a garden, a tree, even a fence post... Um, even your mailbox post, if you have one, you want to call Digger's Hotline. It's a free service for you. Call 72 business hours. They'll come out. Uh, you call 72 business hours before you intend to dig, and then they will mark the underground utilities, your cable, your gas, your whatever it is, because thinking isn't knowing. I know most tomatoes can be red. I know radishes take 32 days to reach maturity. I don't. I, I think I might know where that's under. Thinking isn't knowing. It's a great line from King of Queens, and it has a lot of validity to it. You you can think you might know, but in, when you hit that ten thousand volt cable under the ground, it's not fun. You can die, and uh, you need to know what is under the ground. In right. addition to that, you need to look up. You need to look right, left, front, and back to see what's there and what your plant that you are planting may interfere with. Not next year, but 5, 10, 15 years down the road. Right. And you want to think about what the purpose is of that plant. Is it a shade tree or shrub or bush? Is it something that you're going to get fruit off of? If it's just for flowering, what are you doing with that plant? If it's something you're going to get fruit off of, you're going to want to put it in a place that you can access it. Don't put it back behind some other shrubs, and we're going to have to fight to go get and harvest that fruit. We planted a cherry bush dwarf tree a couple of weeks ago you can find that on the website and it at max we got it from blue males at max it'll get six foot uh, in diameter so what did we do we put it five foot away from the porch so when it gets three foot on one side and three foot on the other we still have about a two foot buffer from the the edge of the bush to the porch so we can access 
you know, cutting grass, the water main, all that stuff. So we're not cramming it up against them because all it may look very cute and pretty right now. But in five years, now that tree is rubbing up against the window on the second story and causing problems. And you might just have to cut it down uh, because it's messing things up. And what you plant, you need to know what you're going to plant because, for example, a willow hybrid tree that most people will plant for a privacy fence it can grow eight to ten foot a year and can get up to 80 foot tall so if you just grab it at the garden center and plant it and not have any clue that thing is going to take going to go a little crazy and may interfere with other types of uh, utilities or property because it's growing 10 foot a year and can get 80 foot tall that's a very tall tree and it can grow very very quickly so uh, that leads us into life, the life expe- expectancy. Expectancy. So you want to think about that. Is that something that's going to be there just for maybe five years, and then it's like a fruiting tree or a nutting tree? How long is that going to be there for? Or how long that will that produce fruit? That can make a difference for your decision as well. Or is that going to be there and outlive you? Right. Uh, is the tree going to outlive you? Uh, we've got a tree in the front yard of our home that was there. It was a, it's a pear tree. Don't know the variety. And people who, when we spoke to, it's been there as long as anybody can remember. It's about 40 feet tall. Well, we the house is over is 100 years old this year. And from what I understand is that there was a farm because there's a right. barn on the land and that there was a small orchard there. So okay. that tree could be over 50 years old, if not older. So you want to kind of think of that. Also, um, what do you plant in that tree? You kind of touched on this earlier. Uh, also, some people just plant trees strictly for the color that it changes in the fall. Not all, you know, you want to make sure that if you're, if you're looking for an aesthetic pleasing tree in the fall, you make sure you do your research because not all of them change red, yellow, orange, whatever the color, are yellow. So you want to make sure that that's the case there. And this goes with bushes or shrubs, too. The, the expectancy or the uh, what the purpose of, and also maintenance. Okay, we put the tree in the ground tomorrow. Looks great. Push the, put the tree, the bush, the shrub. Looks great. You're going to have to do some maintenance. This is not, you're not in, in an open field somewhere. There's some maintenance and that has to be taken care of here. Right, and you have to think about that because if it's something that you want, if it's like a bush or a decorative shrub or something, you might have to trim that. And if you live in a situation ordinances, homeowner association, there's some criteria in which you have to maintain an appearance to your property. And maybe you don't have those requirements from your municipality, your home uh, town, or your home uh, homeowner association. Maybe you just want, you know, maybe you take pride in your neighborhood and you just don't want this thing to be wild and, and look like a wild bush on a, on a farmland. You got to do a little maintenance to these things. To a lot of trees, you don't have to, but the shrubs and the bushes, there's maintenance that's going to have to be required to a certain level. Yeah, but even if you plant some fruit trees, there are diseases that they could, you know, have problems with or pests. So that's something that you want to be aware of. You want to think about that now. It may not happen to your particular plant, but it could. And, and make sure you, if you're buying a nut tree or fruit tree, that it's so, that it works in whatever zone you're in. We're in zone five here. Right, in you probably don't want to try to go grow an avocado yeah, tree here. Yeah, or a banana tree. Get something that you're going to put the effort into, you're going to invest in, that it will pay you back. And a lot of these fruit trees, nut trees, well, the fruit trees, typically three to five years, you will begin to see production. Now, some, some people you'll see, oh, the first year and a half, I got, you know, this, I got fruit off of it. So keep that in mind. And is it a fast growing, like we talked about with the willow hybrid, or is it a slow growing? Is it going to take 15 years to get seven feet tall, or is it going to grow rapidly? What what's the you know what's the the speed of this, and that can determine some factors as well when it comes to your your planting your fruit trees, bush trees, or shrub trees. And, and again, like Holly said, I think the the main thing to take away from this is just don't shove your shovel in the ground. You gotta you gotta do some permit some some prep here right and just don't go to the garden center or wherever and think okay i'm gonna get this this and this because they're pretty because they're pretty and oh my so-and-so has one well your so-and-so may live on three acres of land and you live on a quarter acre that's not necessarily going to work for you yeah it, it it you know these things are typically not really they're not cheap they're not like two or three dollars they're, they're an investment and if you're going to go to the steps of beautifying your property or increasing the fruit production on your property, you should look at what you is best for you. And, and 
just because there are some trees. There, there's like, let's, let's, for example, there's pear trees that produce pears. Okay, there are some trees now on the market, and I believe cherry is one of them. Cherry trees that just produce the flowers. They have been hybridized to where they don't fr- fruit produce. It's strictly just an ornamental flower. Kind of like a, a cherry blossom tree. A blossom, yeah. yeah. And there's no fruit. So if you're going to, and, and you do whatever you want, I don't see the purpose of investing in time and planting and maintenance of a tree that all I'm going to get is a bunch of pretty flowers for a couple of weeks a year. I want something in return for that if I'm going to put it on the property. Uh, it makes makes more sense that way when it comes to uh, maintaining your property. And also maintenance. What kind of... Uh, fertilizer. Do you need fertilizer? A lot of these trees, you don't have to do a whole lot of anything with it, but a certified arborist uh, may be required to take care of some of the issues if you have you know, problems with the upper part of the canopy. Uh, you just don't want to be shimming up the tree with a chainsaw uh, trying to maintain these problems, even with existing trees on the property. Yes, it's money, but how much is it worth the risk of climbing up the tree and falling out and getting hurt or dying? Right, and many fruit trees will get certain types of blight, and that that can be a common problem, so that is something you want to think about. That's another thing. If you're going to plant a certain variety, there are varieties that are more disease-resistant and pest-resistant, so that's something that you, you do want to consider as well. Right, and well, it's raining today, and uh, maybe you have already cut your grass or you're about to cut your grass, and you're really dreading it because you don't have a good piece of equipment. And like anything in life, if you have the right tools, life is a whole lot easier, and errands can help you get the right piece of equipment so you're cutting, you're mowing your grass is a whole lot more enjoyable. Do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in their grass-stained shoes because Aaron's is about to help you set up, step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy-duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is the sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. Visit Aaron's.com for your local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. When we come back, be a Bree author would be with us, and we're going to talk about foodscaping. What does that term mean, and how can it benefit you? We'll go over all of that. Stay with us. Tweet Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala Kombucha makes your body smile. Beans and Barley Market and Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need, from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh juice, carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Really Granola is a small batch Wisconsin-made granola available at reallygranola.com. This granola uses many organic ingredients and features Wisconsin products such as beautiful red Wisconsin cranberries, local honey, and other delicious Wisconsin products. You'll find plenty of fiber and protein in Really Granola, which makes it a great way to start or end your day. This granola is baked in a Wisconsin co-packing kitchen that helps to employ disabled workers. Find Really Granola near you or to buy online, visit reallygranola.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from plantsuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. Plantsuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit plantsuccess.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your destination for all things gardening. Over 900 garden-related videos 
Instagram, Facebook, uh, on a whole lot more. Bree Arthur is coming up in just mere moments. Your questions about 15 minutes away on the IVOrganics.com hotline. But first, Blue Mouse. Uh, we were there a couple of weeks ago uh, doing a talk on Straw Bell Garden. It was last week. Last week, that's mm-hmm. right. Uh, and, and the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. They still got a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruits, uh, trees, ornamental trees. Native they, plants. Plants. Yeah. Uh, you want wood chips? They got wood chips. You want compost? They got compost. You want, you want sand? some decorative stone? They got that. They've got anything you want for your landscape. They also do landscaping and lawn maintenance if you need that done. And they have all sort of uh, fun stuff, too, different pl- potting plants and lawn ornaments and all sorts of stuff. As well as classes or talks every Thursday night through the summer that you can attend for free to learn more uh, about certain aspects of gardening as well as land maintenance. And they have the staff there. That staff knows what they're talking about. It's not just some guy who normally works in paint. Yeah, I don't know the answer. You, uh, Let me get Richard. Maybe he knows. Yeah. No, no, none of that. They no. know when you ask a question and they will talk you out of things that you may want to purchase because they know it's not going to be beneficial for you on your property. So you can see, you can visit them at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. They are just south of Layton. And you can go to bluemills.com or call 414-282-4220. Well, let's go to the ivorganic.com hotline and bring in our next guest, Holly. So um, as a professional gardener, industry communicator, communicator and author, Brie is a leading national suburban foodscape movement, a model of community development that incorporates sustainable local food production. She speaks internationally on a variety of horticultural topics, ranging from foodscape design to technical propagation methods and marketing. As a correspondent on the PBS show Growing a Greener World, Brie shows pra- practical advice on her one-acre suburban foodscape, encouraging everyone to embrace the hobby and lifestyle of home gardening. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, Bree. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's so glad you've taken time out of your uh, obviously very busy schedule to join Holly and myself and our listeners to share some of your garden knowledge with all of us. Well, it's my pleasure. Well, let's talk about your book here. It's it's all about foodscaping. Now, for many people, and I didn't know the term until I did some research on your website, what is foodscaping? Well, I like to define it as the logical integration of edibles in a traditional ornamental landscape. So it's really looking around at the landscapes that we already have and figuring out ways to make them function in this way to be able to also provide us something for our own use in our kitchens. Okay. So you were inspired to grow your own lettuce when you were in college. What brought this on, that decision to do so? What inspired that? (laughs) <laughs> well, it's kind of a gross story, but it was an E. coli infection from salad greens that I had eaten at a local restaurant. And I realized then that, you know, our food supply was really fragile. And I had this great advantage of having studied horticulture. So I had the knowledge and skills to be able to provide some of this for myself. Well, the, the food system is still a little uh, fragile even today. And with your book, you can kind of, you, if you haven't picked up the book, we'll talk about where you can get it in a moment. Very, a lot of photographs, a lot of great information. It's a great uh, coffee table book. Well, I thank you for that. I will tell you, I took a lot of photographs to be able to create this package. <laughs> If, uh, if someone grows uh, hostas or annual flowers in their garden beds, what are some good foodscaping elements that they can, uh, that they can plant right along with them? And I guess the foodscaping, uh, it kind of ties in with some of these homeowners associations or, or, or neighborhoods where you're not supposed to grow stuff in the front yard. But with your book, you can hide the edibles amongst the decorative. Is that kind of what we're looking at here? Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, when I was uh, bought my first home and lived in a very strict uh, homeowners association covenant, I I, I learned that um, you could grow vegetables in this very landscapey way that doesn't look like you're being a farmer. And not only are they not offended by it, they don't even realize that you have a productive landscape. I think most people don't really know what vegetables look like. So... I hope that people will feel empowered to be able to, you know, tuck an heirloom tomato in alongside a a large sun-loving, something like a hydrangea or a big butterfly bush. And, you know, use these elements that you probably already have throughout your landscape and incorporate food alongside because 
the culture can be very much the same. The sun exposure, the irrigation, the, the nutritional needs. So, you know, plants like peppers and eggplants are really great to be able to mingle in with most of your traditional perennials that would be growing and blooming through the summer. Uh, I love to encourage people to plant bed edges. I think bed edges are a space that are really underutilized in traditional landscaping. And you can grow simple things like lettuce just along the edge, direct seeded, or some garlic in. And then you can actually have a meaningful amount of food available to you because there's a lot of square footage in a bed edge. Well, and, and when incorporating some of these cool weather crops in amongst the annuals, you can kind of mimic the shade or day length a little shorter and get some more life out of them versus planting them in full sun, too. Exactly. And, you know, another thing that people don't always realize is that our food crops, even at the home gardener stage, are still kind of like monocultures. You know, we're growing a lot of food from the same plant family. So in the summer, your solanaceae with your tomatoes and peppers, eggplants, uh, potatoes. And what people don't realize is when you stick those all in one concentrated space, from biological perspective, those plants are all the same. So the same diseases and insects can come up. Whereas in your incorporation, in your landscape, the ornamental palette actually offers you a great amount of biological diversity. So now most people... What inspired your book? Did you have a situation with a homeowner's association or a neighbor or something where you decided to really get into this foodscaping or uh, any reason why? Well, uh, I was lucky. You know, I've always been one to try to figure out the solution to a problem. When I moved into that neighborhood, uh, I simply didn't have enough money to be able to buy all the groceries that I wanted to be able to eat. And I figured out ways to take advantage of this open malt space between the shrubs that are basically the prescribed landscape that you get in a new development. And um, I wanted to empower other people that were facing similar economic challenges. And it it was a really incredible thing to be able to use that property and really help uh, change the lifestyles of the people living around me by being able to help share produce and encourage them to take on this hobby of even if they're just growing some lettuce greens, it's this interaction in the landscape that they haven't had before. And I think once people try gardening, even in the smallest way, they realize what a meaningful and valuable hobby it can be and how it can improve your life in so many ways. And I think now, especially, we're living in a time that feels very stressful, and I'd like to encourage people to take on this hobby for their own health and wellness. And, you know, there's some therapeutical science behind getting your hands actually in the soil. Absolutely. And children, they're just desperate to have this interaction. And, you know, it's a joy to be able to share this with the children in my neighborhood and I do work with a a lot of different public school systems to incorporate foodscapes on their campuses. And the children of this time right now are just starved for this knowledge. And it's very encouraging to see how much interest they have and how they really hold on to that knowledge and apply it in a lot of different contexts. Well, with with going on the campuses and schools, what is the general receptiveness of, hey, here who, here's who I am and here's what I do. Would you like this to be done on your property? Are they resistant or are they acceptive of, hey, yeah, we, we, we want that? Or, well, or, or do you I'm have lucky. to kind of or do you have to kind of sell the ideal to them? Well, I'm lucky in that I uh, you know started with one school district in Glassboro, New Jersey. And as a result of the success of their program, which is entirely because of their teachers, the the principal, the superintendent, have all just engaged in such a meaningful way that this program is now spreading to all of the schools within this district and other districts are looking to see what they're doing. You know, when I look at a project, the main points are to make sure that you have the staff is really behind this idea. And... Of course, the goal here is to tie horticulture education into the STEM and STEAM laboratories so that this knowledge can be tested and really quantified and and show that there's a true learning value behind it. This is not just a bonus outside playtime. This is where real knowledge is being uh, shown by example. 
and it's sad that you and you've probably seen this multiple times where children think that tomatoes come from aisle nine at the grocery store. They don't understand that it actually grows out of the ground on a on a plant. Well, and you know what I'm even more shocked by are the number of people my age and and even older that also don't really have an appreciation or an understanding for our food sources. And I think even if everybody just tried growing something easy like garlic one time, they would then, every time they bought garlic at the grocery store, have a greater appreciation for that resource. You know, I, I don't think that we should take for granted the fact that we all can access food whenever we want it. And I'd like to see our society move into more of a mindful understanding of what what it takes, really, to be able to produce food. Right. And, you know, like I've talked to Holly about this. You know, she can go to the grocery store and get a pineapple for 99 cents. Now, that pineapple took 18 months to grow and was shipped from Mexico. Nobody's making any money on this. And it probably is not the healthiest thing being shipped 3,000 miles to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Well, and, you know, I think food miles is something that is going to be an increased problem as we move forward. And, you know, that's exactly it. The average product at the grocery store has traveled 1,500 miles before you pick it up. So you have to multiply everything you have in your grocery cart each week by 1,500 to really get an understanding of what your actual carbon footprint just for consumption is. Right. And a lot of times even it it travels that much and then it sits in a warehouse for three days to a week where it's, I guess, ripening. I'm not really sure what it's doing there. And so it's not just necessarily the journey, which is, you know, burning fossil fuels and producing CO2 into the into the atmosphere, but also the fact that that food is definitely not fresh. One hundred percent. It's it's really disturbing that so much of our food is artificially um, made ripened. And, and I think that there's a, a, a serious devaluization in the nutritional value of the food products that we're accessing now. And I'm encouraged to see a new generation looking at nutrition and wellness as a everyday necessity. It's not a luxury. This is an option for eating healthy that is going to lower your health care costs and make it so that your quality of life is better And I hope that that is truly the direction um, that we all decide to embrace because we could be getting a lot more every single time we sit down to eat a meal than what we are with the processed foods that are the norm for people in our society today. Right. And and we start we're we're mid 30s. So we kind of see the generation or our peers who are having children who are asking us questions about, hey, what are G- GMOs? We're, what about this? What about that? What are, because they're concerned of what they're feeding their children because things have changed in the last 25 years in the food system. In a dramatic way, and it really does concern me. You know, I have taken on this project, this really obsession of growing grains for this exact reason. I'm really disturbed by the number of people that are having digestive issues with regard to gluten. And it makes me think, you know, that there's a lot that we don't understand about how our food is produced. And in trying to develop food systems that are meaningful in the suburbs, I think that grains are actually a very logical uh, element to be able to add to large open green spaces and dissect lawns and actually use mechanization to harvest it. But look at creating more localized alternative carbohydrate sources that are grown organically. Um, I I think there's a a serious problem that's only increasing, and we're seeing this within just the last decade. Um, And who knows the long-term implications, especially for children that are eating these possibly toxic or certainly life-altering carbohydrate sources because of the way we're currently using them in our our commercial agriculture model. Right. And you, that's definitely something to consider. Well, we, we've really enjoyed our our time with you. Can you remind us again where people can find more information about uh, your foods, your your foodscaping knowledge and where to find your book? Absolutely. You can visit my website, breegrows.com. That's Bree, like the cheese, B-R-I-E, grows.com. Well, we so thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us and share a a lot of your gardening knowledge with Holly and myself and our listeners. 
Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been a sincere pleasure. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Bree. And coming up after the break, your garden questions and our garden answers right after this. Have a gardening question? You can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Mantis Plant Protection Professional Grade Organic Pest Control Solutions. They offer Mantis EC concentrated or ready to use sprays. Certified organic and environmentally friendly insect killer. Gentle on pollinators and other organisms, but effective in killing soft bodied insects and spider mites fast. Safe around your children and pets. They also have the cleanest and whitest diatomaceous earth on the market. Visit MantisPP.com to receive a free organic pesticide cheat sheet, which is a list of organic insecticides that are used effectively and kills insects fast. Visit MantisPP.com to download it today. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit Bobex.com. B O B B. BEX.COM. The international food selection at Woodman's is more than just salsa and soy sauce. We stock a huge selection of foods and ingredients from all over the world. Whether it's Asian, Latin American, European, or Middle Eastern, Woodman's has it. Plus, each store has its own unique selection. With Woodman's, you don't need to visit multiple stores to get what you need. We have everything you need under one roof and at a great price. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, Retail Manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. You know, you're insulting a lot of moms right now. Well, that we all forget to water, and you, you know just okay. like I know. Maybe it's not mom's fault, maybe it's... Uh, her husband's fault. Okay. Her okay. Father's well, fault. Who's supposed I, to water? The I think plant. that's a different and, show yeah, okay. on the on the station here. Right. With your hosts Joey and Holly Baird. It's the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com for all your gardening needs. Nine hundred plus videos, digital magazines, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Go over there, journey around, and see what you can find. There's a lot of stuff. It's time for your questions and our answers. And if you've got a question, you can certainly call into the IVOrganics.com hotline and we can answer your question. You can call into the Ivy Organic hotline at 414 444 5250. Ivy Organic 3 in 1 Plant Garden actually protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, rodents, and uh, different bugs, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields, prune, and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. You can find out more ivorganics.com. Again, that's 444 5250 to call in. And at Ivy Organics, it's easy to use. So that's always a plus. So we had a question we here. Got a lot of, yeah, we had a lot of questions come in through uh, our Facebook page, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, our email, twvgradio at gmail.com. Instagram. I think we had some YouTube questions come in. So we're going to address as many as we can uh, to the top of the hour here. So uh, Corey wants to know, and since a lot of us are planting now, it's good to know, but maybe you might forget. Um, if you do not add Epsom salt initially, can you add it later to the soil around the plant? Uh, we do add about two tablespoons of Epsom salt at the time of planting for tomatoes. This is not to fix blossom in rot. This is to help build the cell walls up 
in the soil because ma- uh, magnesium sulfate is Epsom salt and it has the benefic- benefit to making the plant greener, allow it to photosynthesize better, and build this internal walls up on the, on the, the tomato plant or any plant. A lot of farmers would use Epsom salt years ago. So you can use two tablespoons per one gallon of water, just water it in. That's fine. Or just take a handful and throw it at the base of each plant. It will dissolve into the soil just fine. Not a problem. You want to use the unscented, the normal, ordinary. You don't want to use the scented Epsom salt. That doesn't have the, the same properties as the original old-fashioned Epsom salt has. Um, I like this question here because you and I, we grow all sorts of different varieties of vegetables. If you missed that week's show last last week, go to the radio tab. Uh, we talk about six there, but yeah, right. we grow a lot of and, different things. And I think sometimes we take that for granted, you and I, because some of these people know things like radishes as red, the red globe radishes. And tomatoes is red. And tomatoes yeah. is red. Mm-hmm. So we had a question come in actually from my coworker here. Um, Carrie wants to know, what is an icicle radish? An icicle radish has a long, uh, long carrot-like shape, but it is a radish. It takes about 30 days to reach maturity. It is white in pigmentation, and the term comes from icicles. It looks like an icicle, the, the same preference of an icicle hanging off the edge of the roof during the winter. It's white. It has the same type of taste to radishes. Uh, but it's just white, and it has a long, long uh, root to it. It's not bulb; it's just a, a carrot-like shape, and, and it grows just the same. But it, it's, a, it's a different carrot. You get a, to me, I think you get more radish out of that type of icicle, out of the icicle radish, than you do a bulb radish. That's, uh, that's what I think. And then we had another question also about using straw as mulch. And he had asked about using it on his tomatoes, and then he had extra straw to use it on the zucchini. And just so you know, straw is great mulch for around any plants that you have. Right. It works fine. You just want to make sure that you're not uh, covering the plants. If you're seeding, you want to wait for the seeds to come up and then mulch around it. Because sometimes those seeds, if you have too much of a layer of straw, especially on a rainy day, that straw is going to mat down to the, the soil. And it may not allow the seeds to penetrate through that thick layer of straw. So be cautious with the amount of mulch you use if your seedlings are not emerged. If they've already come up like a tomato plant you plant in the ground, uh, you can mulch pretty heavily around that and it'll be just fine. All right. So then Janelle wants to know, she just ripped out some old carpet from a room in her house and was wondering about using it for the garden for a weed control barrier, kind of like a mulch, I would say. Um, and But she was concerned about the possible leaking of toxic chemicals. What was our opinion on using old carpet scraps and padding? I Probably wouldn't use that padding. I wouldn't use the padding. Now, if you're using, if you've got raised beds, so the beds are elevated, you've got soil inside the bed, you can use the the carpet between the beds on the natural ground. Works great. Weed barrel, perfect. I would not use it in the actual physical on top of soil because that can leach into the soil. There's glues. There's uh, pla- you know carpets made of plastic and oils and all this other stuff. Uh, not- there's something called VOCs in your carpet, which is very harmful. Um, it's a very harmful element. It's also in things like dryer sheets and fabric softener, but we won't get into that. Um, but yeah, that's definitely in carpet, so that's something to consider. Yeah, so you can use it again. I think uh, mulch uh, as a, as a weed barrier. If you are in raised bed situations, but even if you have designated grow areas and permanent walk paths in your traditional ground garden, there is the opportunity of leaching. And I would not recommend that you use car- old carpet or new carpet or any type of carpet uh, in that instance. Now, weed barrier fabric, if you want to go that route, that's more uh, uh, safer. That's, you know, that's designed for edible gardens or land landscapes. So that would be an option that I would go with other than the carpet. And then we had somebody ask after we talked about how we're growing 10 different varieties of cucumbers. They said that's a lot of cucumbers you grow. What do you do with cucumbers other than making pickles? And there's a few different things you can do. You can definitely make relish with cucumbers. Um, You can also, many people uh, will just eat them as fresh as possible. That's usually the, the best thing. You can also do fermented pickles, and that's more of the traditional way of making pickles. Some of you may remember the crocs that your your parents or grandparents used to ferment the pickles. And am I right on the terminology there? Yeah, it's a crock. Uh, and then also, but you don't need a crock. No, you can no. do it in a, in a mason jar. Now, also there there's pickle pickles that you do in a water bath canner procedure. And also, isn't there refrigerator pickles that are a much easier process to do? Yeah, you can do. There's a lot of different types of pickles okay. you can make, but there's yeah there's the the canned home canned pickles that are going to be shelf stable. There's the refrigerated pickles, which a lot of people like because they're com- comparable to a store-bought brand that you can find the refrigerator 
and, um, and, 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 and the refrigerator store. pickles what two three two or three uh, if they last that no, long yeah if they last that long i think a couple of months actually okay. and then there's also the fermented pickles which most people who live on the east coast actually are more familiar with than us here in in the midwest Okay, so there you go. A lot of things. You, and you can make cucumber water. You can juice them. You can do a whole lot of things with cucumbers that you normally uh, may not. Uh, and cucumber relish. You can make cucumber relish out of it as right. well. Right. Relish is, is good, too. And, and many people don't think about that because you might buy a lot of relish, and uh, now you're saving yourself some money. Yeah. Um, so Darren wants to know, he watched the video on growing a Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes. He's been looking for a way to grow them without spreading because Jerusalem artichokes are... Not necessarily invasive, but they will spread. Right. And so he wants to know if he puts them in a container, um, he's hoping that they would only spread from the roots and not from any possible seed. Right. Most, and 99% of flowers that occur on Jerusalem artichokes are sterile. They do not have any pollination or seed production properties to it. The best way and really the only way that these things spread is from the roots. They will, they're, they're very similar to the traditional potato. They'll put an eye on and they'll spread that way. So by planting these, uh, Jerusalem artichokes are a perennial that are low star- much lower in starch than a potato. And there's a lot of different uh, property, a lot of different things you can do with them. And they will spread and, and they can be invasive. And if you don't get all of the root root tubers out of the ground, they will come back next year. So by planting them in a container, you're far safer and you'll be able to dump them all out on a tarp and make sure you get all of them so they don't come back. Now, they will produce 4 to 15 pounds per plant. Well, okay, correct. 4 to 9 pounds per plant in good, healthy soil. Average soil, you're looking at about 4 to 6 pounds. We have them in a in a actual garden bed at the large garden, as well as we planted some in a uh, in a container, oh, we planted some back by the compost pile, and we dumped the container out. I forget what the reason was, but they're coming up now, actual ground, because the compost sat on the ground, and they rooted themselves. So now we have Jerusalem artichokes back by the compost bin, as well as in the actual garden. Yeah, Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes are a lovely thing, but you have you do have to be aware of, of how they're going to grow. A lot grow. of preppers will plant these on their property because yeah, they just look like a weed that's right. coming up if you don't know what's underground. So um, here's a really good question. Richard is going to purchase some commercially produce mulch in bags what do you t- what type do you recommend for my garden and raspberry bushes first of all if you're planting this in your vegetable garden that could be problematic that mulch could get into the soil and rob the soil of nitrogen but if you're planting around shrubs or things you that is a, a something you can do also if you just get shredded bark or wood chips the university of madison brian up there they've done studies to show that trees that have been shredded that has diseases after shredding the, the wood chips sat for a year, and the wood chips still harbored that disease. And some of those diseases are deadly to broadleaf plants like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and beans. So you don't want to incorporate them or be very cautious of where you get your wood chips. If you're putting them around asparagus or raspberries or other trees, you should be just fine. And uh, Blue Mills has a variety of mulches in which you can pick from. Well, the program is brought to you every day, or every every day, every week. It would be nice every day. That's a lot of gardening. Every week by great sponsors you've heard throughout the program and are available to click and find more about under the radio tab on our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it. Because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nasala.com. Programming note next week. Tune in. We're going to talk about good bugs in your garden and how to get them there. As well as, did you know you can compost? It's not that difficult. We're going to talk about all about composting 101, which you can do no matter where you are at as well as master gardener, horticulture expert, media expert, uh, who has appeared on the Discovery Channel, TLC, HGTV, QBC, CBS This Morning, from Chicago, Illinois, William Moss will be with us. So until next week, I'm Holly Baird. And I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.